uh, the Old Testament. It's interesting. Uh, Bob showed me an uh, an article by a very, very uh, well-known uh, Christian, really leader, pastor, and he said that the Old Testament is basically like obsolete. It's uh, no longer needed <laughs> for today. And it's interesting. The Bible tells us that in the last days there would be a great departing from the faith. You know, if you've been with us on Sundays, we've been looking at the book of Jude. And it's a book about apostasy, about a departing from the faith. And it's really what we're seeing happen. Guys, listen, if you say you want to know God, what I want to tell you is this. He wrote a book, okay? He wrote a book. It really is that simple. The believer that tells you, well, it's not that simple. I would recommend find somebody else to go to Starbucks with, okay? Um, Because it is that simple. God wrote a book. If you want to know him, listen, he wrote it down. You could get to know him. He wants you to know him. God isn't a mystery that is bound up in one individual or some guru. God has written it in a book because he wants us all, anyone, to be able to seek him. And I encourage you guys, you know, just out on Wednesday, seeking to know the Lord, uh, good, good for you. But if you have your Bibles, we're we're in the book of 1 Samuel. Years and years ago, we started in Genesis chapter 1, and on Wednesday night, we're going right through the Bible. So, you know, if you're looking to know the Bible, to grow in your walk with the Lord, to know God's Word, that's what we do here. And uh, if you want to know the Bible in like a week, um, it's impossible. Uh, 66 books written by, you know, 40 different authors over the course of, you know, a couple of thousand years, but all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And one thing I like to say here is the best way to learn the word is plate by plate. Okay. Plate by plate. You know, it's just like eating an elephant. You try to eat the whole thing in one bite. It's not going to be good. Talk about indigestion, you know, Um, but plate by plate. And what we do here is chapter by chapter, you learn the word, You will grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight we are in 1 Samuel chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 36. And man, this is such a powerful message. Um, It's, uh, if you're taking note, the title to this evening's message is Honor God and You'll Be Honored. Uh, This is a principle that applies to every person, every Christian. If we would catch this, oh, how lives would be changed and transformed. Honor God and you'll be honored. We'll look at that tonight. But before we dive in, let's, let's once again pray. We've got our Bibles open, but we need the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, to really make this alive to us. So Father, we pray tonight, Lord, just with simplicity, we know your word is sharp. It's a double-edged sword. And Father, it, it corrects us. It, it encourages us. Lord, your word nourishes us. Lord, like the children of Israel, the manna we had from yesterday, It's no more today. We need a fresh manna. Lord, we need to hear from you today, to learn of you, to eat of you. So we pray, bring that about in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Amen. The title, Honor God and You'll Be Honored. I was reading the Wall Street Journal, but uh, I read this article and it it really broke my heart. Uh, More young veterans committing suicide. The VA data show among U.S. veterans ages 18 to 34 Suicide has jumped to 45 per 100,000 population in 2016. Uh, it's, it, it's up quite a bit. And the rate of suicide, I'll read a little bit of the article, among young military veterans has increased substantially, guys, despite the efforts by the Department of Veterans Affairs to curb the problem. Though overall veteran suicides declined slightly, according to new data uh, released this week, uh, the, the, the veterans between that the younger veterans are taking their life in, in really record numbers. Guys, listen, uh, as we dive into the word tonight, I want you to know this. The word of God, you and I taking in the word and applying it to our life, it literally has uh, uh, incredible repercussions for the lives of those around us. Um, I would gather that this past week and you're coming and going to the grocery store, to work, driving in your neighborhood, you have passed multiple people that are at life's, the the end of their rope, okay? Uh, The words of Jesus that you and I are the salt of the earth, I don't think have ever been more needed to be heeded by God's people than they are today. You are the salt of the earth. And we're gonna look tonight about honoring God. Honoring God, it's so important that you and I catch this. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, he said, show me the man you honor and I will know what kind of man you are. Uh, it's really that simple. 
you know, who we honor, who we value, what we honor, what we value really will determine what type of people we are, guys. Uh, you know, it's amazing how the enemy, the Bible said, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And sometimes we don't realize that. We think, you know, I'm going to stay close to the Lord. I'm on fire for Jesus. And what the Lord does is little by little, he exchanges something of the Lord for something of the world. Little by little, something of the Lord, something of the world. Little by little, something of the world for something of the Lord. And before we know it, our hearts have drifted. It's the principle of honor. It's what we're going to see tonight that's going to be spoken to Eli the prophet by an unknown prophet, by an unknown prophet to to all of us, those who honor God, God will honor. I love this story. Uh, his name is John uh, Sobieski III. He was the king of Poland in the late 17th century. So, you know, a couple hundred years ago. But his impact was powerful, and I love what he said. He is best remembered as the man who saved Central Europe from invading armies of Turks in 1683. With the Turks at the walls of Vienna, Sobieski led a charge that broke the siege. His rescue of Vienna is considered one of the decisive battles in European history. In announcing his great victory, the king paraphrased the famous words of Caesar by saying simply, I came, I saw, but he changed what Caesar said. Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered. Sobieski said, I came, I saw, God conquered. God conquered. Can you guys say God conquered? conquered. We're going to see that tonight. You know, the question is, are you and I going to honor God? And as we move here into 1 Samuel, we're going to see just just what that looks like. We're going to see one man that honors God, really a young boy, and then priests, you know, Eli the prophet, Eli the priest, and his sons not really honoring God. So we're going to pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 18. It says, but Samuel. Can you guys say, but? Can you say, but? You see, anytime you see that, it means it's a contrast. I know you felt a little uncomfortable. I'm trying to break you guys up here tonight. But Samuel, he starts off, ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a a linen ephod, verse 19. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Verse 20. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. Verse 21, And the Lord, it says, visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now listen, if you're taking note, the first principle we're going to see tonight about honoring God. Honoring God. Listen, if you and I honor God, the Bible gives us a promise. Those who honor God, God will honor. And the first principle we're going to see here tonight, number one, if you want to honor God, number one, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. We're going to see what that means. You see, Samuel, he's a young boy. Remember, uh, we've studied this. Uh, his mother, Hannah, told, told him, uh, told Eli the prophet and made a promise to the Lord that if If God gave her a son, she would give him back to the Lord. And that's exactly what she did. Now now Samuel was there in the temple, and it says Samuel ministered before the Lord. The reason why it starts off, verse 18, but Samuel is because it's in contrast to Eli's sons. You see, the high priest at the time, his name was Eli, and his sons back in verse 12, it says, now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. You know, Eli was a priest, but he didn't teach his kids. They didn't know the Lord. You know, uh, it's such a, a scary thing. I know many of us, maybe you have, you have children that know the Lord. Maybe you have children that don't know the Lord. I know for me, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been an adventure. I love leading people to Christ, discipling people. But probably my greatest fear, my greatest fear would be that my children didn't meet Jesus and know him. Yeah, you know, I don't know that I could think of something worse personally. Um, it, it, it's something that I pray over and really want to make sure that, you know, God forbid I, you know, win the homeless guy a quick check to Christ, but, but miss my kids, right? Miss them. And it's an exhortation to all of us. But it says Samuel, this young boy, who his mother Hannah, she only had him for a few years, but she just invested in his life. She taught him the things of God. And moms, dads, don't think, oh, my kids aren't old enough. Okay, that's silly. 
you know. The, they have the Disney Channel, very young, already filling their minds with plenty of things, right? Uh, Nickelodeon, all these things. They understand that we can already start to push the, the culture's agenda on them at a very young age. And yet in the body of Christ, we think, oh, they're not old enough. Mm, not so much. You could teach them the ways of the Lord. And it says even this young Samuel, it says he ministered to the Lord. If you're taking note, circle that word minister. Circle it. Understand that the Hebrew is sharaf. It means to serve, to attend as a worshiper, to wait on. You see, what does it mean to be a minister? A minister. It doesn't mean that you have a black shirt and a white collar. Uh, no offense to anyone, but that does not make you a minister. You can actually buy those at the uniform stores. I've seen them. Um, you know, it's not, it's not what it is. The word minister means, it means to be a worshiper, a, a worshiper of God with, with the actions of your life. That's what it means to be a worshiper of God with the actions of your life. That's what God wants from you. That's what God wants from me. You see, humans are by design worshipers. I don't know if you realize that. By design, you're a worshiper. We're constantly prostrating ourselves in our hearts to something or someone. Every person, every one of us. I believe and the Bible teaches this. Listen, situated in every person is a spiritual altar. In every single one of us, there is a spiritual altar. And seating, seated on that altar is the most important object of our lives. That's how it works. You know, that's why you can have someone that say, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but really seated on the altar of their life is something totally the opposite. You know, I prefer the one that doesn't say much, but, but really seated on the altar of their life is Jesus, right? We're desiring that. We want that. You see, it says young boy Samuel ministered to the Lord. He served the Lord with his, with his lives. You know, the concept of worship, guys, is more than singing hymns. It's so much more. It's what are we serving with our life? And it, it says there that Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child. If you have your pen, circle that, even as a child. You know, as I said this here before from the pulpit, there is no junior Holy Spirit, okay? There is none. Don't be little God. He loves and delights. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, uh, God has chosen the foolish things of the world. God delights in it. In the Old Testament prophets, it says, it says that uh, praise, you know, that, that, that God has perfected praise through his saints, through simplicity, through children. He loves it. Your kids, teach them of the ways of the Lord. It says there, even as a child, and he was wearing a linen ephod. If you have your pen, underline that. Such a cool thing. This gives you a picture into the character of who God is, what he's like, what he's interested in. You see, as a little boy, he was learning the ways, and he was also learning the whys of God. Samuel was learning the ways and the whys of God. You see, even in Christian education, we have to be careful with this. You know, we're Westerners, we have church, you know, we have children's classes and all these things, and they're nice. But guys, even in all of this, Jesus Christ cannot be obtained through academia. It is impossible because Jesus is a person. Just like if I wrote you a book on my wife, it doesn't mean that you really know her. <laughs> you just know about her. You see, Jesus is real. He's to be known. And we should be teaching our children the ways and the whys of God. You see, Eli's sons were corrupt. They would have been the priests that would have followed Eli into the priesthood. But guys, catch this. God raised up Samuel. You know, I hear this all the time in the body of Christ. You know, oh, so-and-so fell or this thing happened. And ultimately, God, corrupt ministers do not stop or hinder the work of God. They do not. That is a fallacy. When God sees one man or one woman who no longer says, hey, I want to serve you, God says, okay, no problem. He'll raise up someone else in their place. He will, like this. He saw it in advance. He was already preparing Samuel to take Eli's place, to take his son's place. You see, every time there are ministers like Eli, in Eli's sons, God raises up Samuel's. But this lean and ephod is important. If you're taking note, you could jot it down. Ezekiel 44, verse 17 through 18. Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet. And the whole Bible, really, that's how you learn the Bible. That's why, you know, I can't really just, like, you know, you have to study the Bible. Because it all fits together. It's a beautiful thing. And God, you can know him, actually. 
uh, Ezekiel 44, verse 17 through 18, it says, It shall be, whenever they enter the gates of the inner court, these are the priests, that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. They shall have linen turbans on their heads, linen trousers on their bodies. And he tells us why. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. You see, that's why the first principle here about honoring God is don't sweat it. Can I tell you, God doesn't want it. He doesn't want our human efforts. He doesn't. I know that's an offense to the church of Jesus Christ today in America, but it is the word of the Lord. It is not negotiable. God doesn't want it. If you are serving the Lord to get his favor, you're missing it. That's not it. Remember Elijah, the prophets of Baal, they tried to get God's favor. They're cutting themselves. They were really sincere, zealous, but their God didn't respond. Elijah did nothing of this sort. Elijah knew his God and he just prayed. He knew he was saved by grace through faith. You see, the priests that God, you know, for the priests, God wanted their service to him to be, to be filled and fueled by his spirit. And Jesus speaks to us in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. If you, if you haven't really sat down and taken some time in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, I would highly recommend it. You know, Jesus speaks to you and I, and he calls us a royal priesthood. And he tells us there, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He was speaking to all the religious people, you know. So many Christians today, they, they're trying so hard to get God to like, like them. Meanwhile, Jesus has already told you that he likes you and he loves you. And, and he wants to have relationship with you. You don't have to spend all your time trying to get to God. He's right there. You need to recognize who you are and he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. Learn. See, Samuel, by the grace of God, was learning things God's way. It's beautiful. I love that. Um, it's an interesting thing in the church world today. You know, I hear the ideas of discipleship and different ideas like this. And for me, I believe, I, I haven't seen much fruit. I've seen a push for discipleship over the last you know, 20 years that I've been saved and I've seen very little discipleship. And the reason why is, guys, listen, let me give you a little hint. None of us really disciple anyone, okay? It's not real, you know. Uh, you and I don't have the access into that part of the person where the scalpel has to get. You see, the only one who has the access, you know who it is? It's, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the person of God. You see, you and I, the best disciplers, the best we are, are just vessels that keep people's eyes on Jesus. We're just like, hey, you know, I hear, I hear you. But, you know, and we're just trying to point people, what's the Lord doing? What's the Lord doing in my brother or sister in Christ's life? That's, that's the best we can do. When we start overstepping that, I call that being the junior Holy Spirit, you know, and the word junior being emphasized in that junior part. Because we're the lesser, it's not even close. You know, it's not, not even close. And I, I encourage you. And it says there that meanwhile, at the end of verse 21, in the midst of all this corruption, in the midst of Eli's sons not doing the right thing, it says, meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. You know, that's an amazing, amazing thing, church. That no matter what the, the world may be doing around us, no matter the circumstances you may be in, maybe it's your marriage or maybe it's uh you know you're a young person living you know under the context of a secular household listen you can still grow in your walk with the lord it's not true some of the most powerful christians i know or young people i've seen grow up did not grow up in christian homes and i love this uh this writing it's by aw tozer and just settle down for a minute just listen it's very powerful i want to read this to you it says aw tozer brings this out brilliantly he says, we are all in process of becoming. We have already moved from what we were to what we are. And we are now moving toward what we shall be. The perturbing thought is not that we are becoming, but that we are becoming not that, uh, but that we are not, uh, excuse me, but what we are becoming, he said. Not that we are moving, but toward what we are moving. For it is not in human nature to move on a horizontal plane. We are either ascending or descending. 
mounting up or sinking down. When a moral being travels from one to another position, it must always be toward the worse or toward the better. It has been established here, I hope, that human nature is in a formative state and that it is being changed into the image of the thing it loves. Men and women are being molded by their affinities, shaped by their affections, and powerfully transformed by the artistry of their loves. In the unregenerate world of Adam, this produces day by day tragedies of cosmic proportions. Think of the power that turned an innocent pink-cheeked boy into a Nero, Nero or a Hitler. And was Jezebel always the cursed woman whose head and hands the very dogs with poetic justice refused to eat? No, once she dreamed her pure girlish dreams and blushed at the thoughts of womanly love. But soon she became interested in evil things, admired them, and went on at last to love them. There the law of moral affinity took over, and Jezebel, like clay in the hand of the potter, was turned to the deformed and hateful thing that the chambermaids threw down from the window. Guys, listen. Every one of us is going in a direction here tonight. Samuel, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of even, you know, chaotic surroundings, grew, the Bible says, in the Lord. He grew in the Lord. Now let's continue. Verse 22. It says, Now Eli, he's the high priest at the time, was very old. And the next chapter tells us when he dies, he was 98 years old when he dies. So at this point, he's probably in his, in his late 80s. And he, he heard everything his sons did to all Israel. Look at this. And how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now listen, stop there. We're talking about honoring God, and God is about to clean house in his house. Number two, if you're taking note, in terms of honoring God, guys, listen, sexual holiness matters. It matters to God. You know, God has his ways. He has what's right, and he has what's wrong. And listen, um, you know, uh, there, there's a book, it's, it's called, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a newer book out by Albert Moeller, and he's talking about just the impact of the sexual revolution in how the seeds that were planted then were really reaping them now. And we're seeing like in the culture, like just an insane, just rebellion against what God says about sex, what God says about being a man, <laughs> what God says about being a woman, what God says about marriage. And, and this is what I want you to get here. When God says these things, he's not saying it from the attitude of a parent to the child. You know, if your kids have ever asked you, you know, you say, go take out the trash, and they go, why? And you go, because I said so. You ever done that? I, I did that before. But he's not saying it like that. When you say, why? God's saying it because I, because I love you. When God says, this is how, you know, sex outside of marriage is not my thing, man. You know, I, I've created it to be, be a beautiful thing, and God is the originator of this. But it's to be in the context of marriage. That's what God is blessed. Is what he says is, is good and acceptable. And here we see Eli, an old man. He's a priest in God's house. And, he, and, and what's happening is his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, it says, are laying with the women who assemble at the door of the tabernacle of meaning. Obviously, this means sexual morality. With the women who are coming to worship. These priests were standing at the door. And they were doing the wrong things. They were coercing women into the, the, you know, sexual acts. We're seeing it in the news today. You know, in the church today, we hear about this all the time. I mean, when a, a pastor or a Christian minister falls, it's generally on the front page. And we're seeing it in the Catholic church, what's happening. And what happens when we, you know, when we, leave, when we lose our grip on Jesus we start to make Christianity about all these other things. We start looking in other areas for fulfillment. We find ourselves pulled away from, from Jesus. And it's really just a matter of time. It's the old proverbial frog in the pot. You know, you put the frog in the cold water, you turn the heat up slowly, and eventually it'll get, it'll get cooked. And that's what happens. That's what happens. That's what happened here. And don't miss this. Guys, listen. 
God is going to deal with Eli. He's going to deal with his sons. But don't miss this. Anyone, any group that causes a, a blockade in God's house from the, those that the Holy Spirit is bringing to get to God, don't miss this. God will deal with them. God will deal with them. You know, um, we've been on Sundays looking at the book of Jude about apostasy. Listen, the amazing thing in my time in ministry is that God deals with things. You know, often people will think that, oh, Pastor Bill did this or Pastor Bill did that. And often, guys, I did nothing. <laughs> really. All I did is teach the Bible and, you know, God deals with things. God knows the hearts of man. He knows when there's, there's devious motivations and these, these other things. And God will deal with it. Because anything that will block, if God wants to bring someone in to hear the gospel and for them to know that God loves them and really desires to have a relationship with them and to change their life, anything that will block that ability of the Holy Spirit to work, God is going to move, remove that. That's what he does. And it's a work of the Spirit, you know. And here we see, even with Eli and his sons, God is going to deal with this. Let's move on, verse 23. It says now, it says, so he said to them, so Eli now finds out about this, and it says, he says to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. He says, no, my sons, for it is not a good report. It is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, he says, who will intercede for him? It says, nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Verse 26, and the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. Now listen, if you're taking note, it's number three in terms of honor God and you'll be honored. Number three is there does come a point in our walk with the Lord in our maturing in Christ, that we have to think about others. Honor God by thinking about others. You know, before you go to make a decision, think about others. You know, um, it's a tough thing sometimes. We miss this. And for Eli, he goes to his son and he starts off, if you have your pen, it's there in verse 23. It says, so he said to them, why? If you have your pen, circle that word, why? Now listen, this word is in the original language, but in my Bible, I have it X'd out. And the reason why is when you're dealing with your kids, don't ask them why. <laughs> when your kids do something wrong or they rebel, don't go to them and go, why? Don't, don't ask them why. They, you're their parent. You're their parent. You're to teach them the whys of God's word, and that will make them wise. You know, when we go to our kids and we... You know, we go, uh, you know, why did you do this, right? Well, the Bible says that because there's a sinful nature in them, and that's why there are kids, and it's our job to parent them and to teach them, well, listen, I know you did this, but Junior, listen, this is what God's Word says. You know, God says not to do that, you know. Just because you feel like punching your sister in the face doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> the Bible says love your neighbor, Right? Pray for those who persecute you. That, that's our job, guys. And, you know, we, we have to be careful. There's definitely been a move in the culture kind of to uh, pander to our children. And, you know, for you adults, you probably can look at the big picture, look at the adults as the culture panders to the adults. It actually doesn't bless those people. Um, it doesn't bless them. I remember years ago, we uh, planted a church in, in East Harlem in northern Manhattan and and it was, uh, you know, you're, you're seeing folks get saved. And really, the, the majority of the population there is on, uh, you know, public assistance. Well, they get born again. They're grown men. And, you know, there came a point in their lives, because, because I love them, that, you know, they'd grow. They'd read their Bibles. They'd begin to grow in their walk with the Lord. And there would be a point where I would sit down. I'd look them in the eyes and I'd say, listen, I love you. But this is the thing. You know, I got to tell you the truth. One of the reasons why you're you're kind of depressed and you're not really growing is because you have to go get a job. <laughs> and, it, and I'll tell you, it sounds harsh, but for these men, it was the best thing that ever happened to them. 
you know, we've, we've seen men go on to get very good jobs and grow and mature and make money and move out of that situation and be able to pull themselves out of it. But how does that happen? It's not by saying why, it's by teaching them the whys. Teach them what the Bible says. Teach them what God's word says, what God plans for them. And Eli here, guys, when it, come, when it came to parenting, when it came to raising his kids and speaking to his sons, I want to say this. Eli did not have any guts, okay? He had no guts. He was afraid of how his sons were going to respond to him. He was afraid to tell his boys the truth. Say, listen, I love you. This is the deal, though. This is what God's word says. And I've seen this before in parenting, and I'm going to tell you this. It doesn't work. <laughs> it does not work. I've watched kids go from bad to worse in this environment because mom and dad just don't say the course. They say, okay, well, we'll modify everything for you, Sonny. You know, doesn't work. You honor God, God will honor you. God will honor you. These boys were stealing from God's house. They were sleeping with women, women in the church. <laughs> this is not an appropriate response. This was not. And Eli said to them, you make the people transgress. You know, if you want to honor God, it's more than lip service, guys. You have to catch this. I know it's the Wednesday night crowd, so I'm going to speak to you maturely from the Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, Jesus speaks about um, believers. He speaks to religious people, and he says, it would be better for you, quote unquote, mature Christian." If you tied a millstone around your neck and threw it into a lake and let it bring you to the bottom, then that you, quote unquote, mature religious Christian, cause a younger believer to stumble. Um, I believe, this is from my heart to you as a church, I believe the Lord wants to bring revival. I do not believe the church of Jesus is even remotely close to mature enough to, to be able to disciple a revival. Not even close. Uh, We see it in our own church. We see people get saved. I was speaking to a pastor of a much larger church, and they said they haven't seen a conversion in like 10 years. Big church. They don't see conversion. They see people coming from other churches, but not people getting born again. And I said, well, we see, you know, we see people get born again here. Yeah, quite a few. But what happens, it's generally a more, quote, unquote, seasoned believer that stumbles them. This just happened. The other day, I was at Suffering Day, Talking to, uh, you know, we're sharing the gospel and one of the sisters was sharing with me about, you know, somebody who's, you know, received Christ here, but just stumbling. And they said, I finally found out what happened. (laughs) And as the pastor, I usually know anyhow, I just don't say anything and I pray about it. And she went to tell me and I said, let me, let me just guess. And I said, and she goes, how did you know? I said, well, I have this pastor spider sense, you know, I just, I just know. I just saw the conversation taking place. And, you know, often I can't, you know, sometimes people are like, well, why didn't you stop it? It doesn't work like that. Imagine you're in a conversation. And I just knocked the coffee out of your hand. No, it doesn't work. You know, what I have to trust is that God's people are growing up in their faith and learning, you know, that you can't take a nursing baby, right? And give them a porterhouse steak, you know. I'm trying to believe that God's people maturing to that place. It's important as God's people, we remember where we were when we were first saved. And what could happen, you know? Because it's important to the Lord. If you want to honor God, it's more than you just doing spiritual things. You have to, as the point was, you have to think about others. You have to think, how is my actions going to affect others? You know, um, there's a debate in Christianity today. uh, Whether pastors can drink alcohol. I don't know what the debate is. I really don't. The Bible says it's so clear when you read 1 Timothy, the qualifications of a bishop. Qualification, if you want to drink and be in ministry, deacon is your thing, man. That's your thing. It says deacons can have some alcohol. But when you read about bishops, it says, no, no alcohol. And, uh, you know, I was on a website of another church and the pastor was saying how one of his main hobbies was drinking. And, uh, and I said, you know, it's interesting. The Bible says that's wrong. My wife, though, because she's smarter than me, uh, she said, you know, that's not even the worst part. The worst part is he's not thinking of all the people he's going to stumble. All the people that are going to read that that struggle with alcoholism, 
And they're going to go, well, if Pastor so-and-so can do it. And it's, it's really true. We miss that. You know, you, you and I have to think that way. Be careful. Be careful in that arena. Well, let's move on. Verse 27. He says this. It says, then a man of God, and this is going to be through verse 33. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord. We don't know who this prophet was, who this man of God was. He's one of those anonymous people in the Bible. Thus says the Lord, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Verse 29, the prophet says to Eli, why did you kick at my sacrifice? Basically, why did you despise the things of the Lord? And my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place. He says, and honor your sons more than me. To make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Verse 30. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. This is that verse. If you have a pen, underline it. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. We'll come back to that. Verse 31, behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And all the descendants of your house shall, shall die in the flower of their age. Now, man, that sounds like a pretty harsh judgment, doesn't it? And that's why the Bible says in James 3, Verse 1, that let not many assume to be teachers, for they will receive a stricter judgment. That's the type of judgment God has for those that assume or walk in the role of responsibility in the church and take it lightly. It's very serious. Now, number, number four, we're almost, we're almost through here. But in terms of honoring God in the text, number four, if you're taking note, is value Him, value God above all else. Value God. This anonymous prophet, this man of God is sent to him, to Eli. And he says to him, he says, you honor your sons more than me. You honor, that word honor, if you're taking note, it means to enrich, to make valuable, or to give wealth. He says, you place more value on your sons or daughters than you do on me. You make allowances for your children to sin, to allow them to, to, to and, and when you allow them to sin, it's sin for you. It's not good. You know, it's not good. Guys, listen. What is acceptable in the culture today that parents are allowing their kids to do? I want to tell you something. It's not acceptable in the word of God. It's just not. It's not acceptable. You, know, you need to be very careful. Uh, you know, just reading, I'm reading this book on the sexual revolution. You know, the number one age of pornography, the most users is from 10 to 12 years old. 10 to 12 years old. You know, we're going, why are all these kids taking their life? I have a couple ideas, guys. I have a couple ideas. God, God says, it's not good for you. I love you. I know the plans I have for you. And the world is baptizing children into filth, into pollution. You know, by the time they're 18 years old, they don't even, they can't even see straight. Truly. That's why I started off with that article. Because guys, listen. If the church of Jesus Christ wants to be used to the Lord for his purposes, we have to honor God. You have never seen in the his church history, there has never been in the history of the church, a church that conformed to the patterns of this world for the purpose of reaching the world that did any good for God. Nothing. It's always been when the church rejected it and says, we're going to honor God, that God honored the church and the Holy Spirit poured out. But you know, guys, it takes a little guts here, you know. You Got to stay the course. You Got to keep your eye on Jesus. God said to Eli, he says, you honor your sons more than me. You know, I put in my notes here, I, I believe Eli wanted to be cool in his kid's eyes. You know, he kind of wanted to be cool. I see that. Parents want to be cool to their kids. You know, parents, little, little, little hint. If you try to be cool for your kids, you're not going to be cool. 
Not only are you not going to be cool, you're going to be really, really not cool because it's really just embarrassing. You know, you ever seen that? It doesn't work. Don't try to be cool. Be their parent. They only get one mom and one dad. They'll have plenty of friends. Plenty of friends. One mom, one dad. Be their mom. Be their dad. Be that person in their life. It's important. It's important. And then he goes on, he says, those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. If you could catch this, individual, believer, man, woman, (laughs) teenager, if you could catch this, those who honor God, God will honor. (laughs) I have come up against so many oppositions, familial oppositions. I've come up against ministry oppositions. And, and through it, and I've made plenty of mistakes, but through it, I've sought, Lord, I want to honor you. I want to honor you. Lord, help me to honor you. And when I felt like I didn't honor God in a situation, I tried to say, listen, I'm sorry. I didn't honor God in this situation. But it's amazing what the Lord will do. He keeps you. It does not matter. There is not, no circumstance that will break the promise of God. A.W. Tozer, he says, the man who has God as his treasure has all things in one. If you honor God, you have everything. Everything. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. I love this story. Many of you have probably heard this before. Eric Liddell, he was, uh, if you saw the movie, it was a Chariots of Fire. I think that was on him. Eric Liddell was one of Britain's great athletes. And later, he gave his life for Jesus on the mission field. And in 1924, he was to run for Britain, for, Britain, for England in the Olympics when it was discovered that the preliminary heats of his best event, the 100 meters, would be run on a Sunday. Quietly but firmly, Liddell refused to run. The day of the 400 meters race came, and as Liddell went to the starting blocks, an unknown man slipped him a piece of paper in his hand with a quotation from what we just read, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. Those who honor God, God will honor. That day, Eric Liddell set a world record in the 400 meters. I'm telling you guys, it's the deal. In anything, in your work, in your finances, in your marriage, your personal life, when you wake up in the morning, put God first, honor God, you will see a blessing in every single area. It's just what God does. We could give you example after example after example. For Eli here, this was a principle that was spoken to him Not because he honored God, but because he did not honor God. And there's a double-edged sword, as it said, those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You know, guys, when we begin to think that we are indispensable in God's purposes and plans, man, the Lord in heaven, the, the machinery begins to and grind to a halt because we said, you know what, Lord, I'm gonna... You didn't do what I wanted, so I'm not going to do this for you. And we think, without us, Lord, you can't do it. You will find out so quickly. <laughs> you know, I remember one, I think Pastor Chuck said once, if you ever take your finger and you put it in a bucket with water, he goes, as fast as you pull your finger out, that's how quickly you'll be replaced. Like God, it's our privilege to be used to the Lord. I've shared this illustration before. But years ago, we went whitewater rafting in uh, North Carolina, it was in the Ch- Ch- Chattooga River. It was, it was insane. It was an amazing experience. I would highly recommend it. But I'll never forget, you know, kind of going down it. And when we were going to go down this river, you know, there's all these big guides, these dudes, big biceps ready to go. And I'm like, all right, I'm good. And it just so happened, the person that was going to be our guide, she was like 110 pounds. You know, these little arms. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're all going to die. You know, that's what I thought. But she was actually probably the smartest of them all. I mean, other boats were getting stuck in the rocks and people were falling out and she just navigated us. And I remember when we finished and we're kind of there, we're watching the, the, the clips of all, you know, they take pictures as you go down all the big falls. And I remember kind of laughing and seeing all of us, right? When we're going down the fall, no matter how courageous you are, it, it just something happens. It's scary. You dive in the boat, right? And there she is at the back sitting up tall, steering the ship. And that's really how this thing, Christianity, really works. It's really how it works. 
is we're in the midst of a trial and we think, I did it, I accomplished. Meanwhile, if you look at the slides, you look at the pictures, there you are in the corner, sucking your thumb. It's going, Lord, please help me. And the Lord's getting you there. He's directing it. The key is just stay in the boat. It's okay. But he's doing it. Those who honor God, guys, God will honor. Don't think yourself indispensable. Stay humble, really, especially if the Lord is blessing you, especially if he's working in your life. Stay humble. In verse 34, let's finish up. It says, now this shall be a sign to you, Eli, that will come upon your two sons on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. You know, guys, listen, I just want to stop for a moment, and I encourage you Bible students, do not take the ministry lightly. It has happened in our day. You know, I'm not here to tell you, call me pastor or nothing like this. If you're a part of this church, you know that is the opposite of how we function here. But I don't want you to miss this. The ministry is, is not light. It's not. Read your Bible. When ministers goof around, God deals with them. So if you're reading this going, wow, this is really harsh. Well, it's because God takes it seriously. He really truly does. He says, in one day they shall die, both of them. So both Hophni and Phinehas, they thought they were getting away with sleeping with women in the church and things like this. They did not get away with it. Verse 35, then I will, God says, raise up for myself a faithful priest. You want to know what a minister should look like? Faithful. Who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. They're not self-willed, but they're seeking the will of God. I will build him a sure house. For that minister, there'll be a foundation, structure, solidity. And he shall walk before my anointed forever. Verse 36. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please, put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. And God is basically saying there, listen, I'm going to restore the reputation of the priesthood that you've destroyed, that you've brought down, Eli. Uh, a couple things, we'll finish here. Number five, in terms of honoring God. You want to honor God, you need to come again to Jesus. The most honoring thing you could do, the, most, the way you could show God that you value him is go and spend time with him. You know, in the Greek, the word honor, it's amazing. I remember studying this years, years ago. And I went to study it in the Greek, and I look it up, and the Greek word for honor is T-I-M-E. Time. It's where we get our English word for, for you guys that can spell and read, time. Yes, very good. That's it. You want to show God you honor him? Give him time, man. You know, spend time with him. Rest in him. Rest in him. Come to him. Sit with him. And who is this faithful priest that's predicted here? I think Samuel kind of, kind of fulfills this. Uh, later on in 1 Kings, there's a priest, his name is Zadok. Eli's line will end, and a new priest lineage will come, and it'll be the priest of Zadok. I think he kind of fulfills it. But I really think this is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He's that ultimate faithful priest. You and I, guys, we could come to before the Lord at any time. Anytime you come to the Lord and you say, God, I know I've blown it today. I know I had this problem or that problem. or It's been a while, Lord, since I've come. He's faithful. He's waiting. He desires to meet with you. He, he cares for you and I. And I would say, come again to the great high priest. Listen, next week, we'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, chapter 4. There's going to be a prophecy. This is going to be Samuel's first prophecy. And really, this whole book of 1 Samuel is... God's people are going to bring about man's king. And then in 2 Samuel, the next book, it's going to be God bring about, bringing about his king, what he wants to do. But this week, guys, I can't encourage you enough. Honor God. Honor God in your life, in your personal lives. Honor God with your families. Honor God. Can you guys honor God? Do it. I can't. That's what the church needs. We need to honor God again. You know, honor him. Amen?